Klein here on CCP TV, the educational channel of Community College of Philadelphia. Today's presentation will be Grammar Come Alive. And I hope it does. You know, let's say you're a young grandfather or a young grandmother, or let us say you're an older grandfather or an older grandmother. Wouldn't it be wonderful for the grandkids to say to you, gosh almighty, grandmom, granddad, they're so smart. They're helping me with my grammar. Well, you know, folks, if you're going to a wonderful place called Community College of Philadelphia, you listen to what your English professor says to you. Don't take what I say as gospel. If you're going to another school, listen to what that professor says. Don't take what I say as gospel. And I know that those professors make grammar come alive. But today we're going to give a little different twist to grammar. And again, ladies and gentlemen of the viewing audience, grammar come alive. There's a professor at Middlebury College. Middlebury College, a very prestigious school as good as Community College of Philadelphia. And that professor is Dr. J. Perini. And Dr. Perini is known for making grammar come alive in his classrooms. I've had the benefit to see Dr. Perini in action. And believe me, it is in action. Good day, everyone. Let's get into grammar come alive. Many of you may know of the comedian Victor Borgia. Victor Borgia, B-O-R-G-E, a Danish comedian. And he did a thing with grammar that was his best type of performance. For example, a comma with Victor Borgia was not a comma, it was a A semicolon was not a semicolon, it was a Quotation marks were Victor Borga did something with grammar. So please take today's presentation in the vein, in the essence of Victor Borga. Of course, I am not he and never could be someone like that. But Grammar Come Alive will deal with the Victor Borga and Jay Perini type of action. You know, one goes to colleges all over the world, and sometimes they do this. Sometimes you're put into a room and you're told to write an essay. And before one writes the essay, they want to get a gauge as to one's intelligence. And they have a different way of finding one's intelligence, a different meter, if you will. And how do some colleges and universities do it when you're in that room just before you're going to write the essay, the entrance type essay? They put the word spearmint on the screen, S-P-E-A-R-M-I-N-T, spearmint, a wonderful flavor. And they ask the person who wants to get into that college, how many words can you get out of the word spearmint? You know what I'm talking about, spear, in, mint, tin, P, P-E-A. How many words can you get out of the word spearmint? And they consider that as an indicator as to one's intelligence, like a mini IQ test, if you will. Well, there is a correlation between spearmint, or any word, and grammar. You'll see what I mean. Oh, will I get into it already? Yes, I will, and here I go. The most common errors in the English language, not in this order, but if one were to Google it or do research, one would find that these are the most common everyday errors that one can find. Now, I'm not going to go into the grammar reasoning behind it. I'm just going to cite the error. People say, between you and I, I know that Ryan Howard's going to be back soon starring for the Phillies, between you and I. But between you and I is wrong. It's between you and me. I won't go into the reasons for it. Maybe a little later I'll get into that. But between you and me, that's the highest ranking error that people in America do. And then you have the word lengthy. Lengthy, you say? 
Yes, I do say. Because most people in the world and in America say lengthly. It was a lengthy heat spell we've been having in Philadelphia. It's not lengthy. It's lengthy, ladies and gentlemen, of the community college viewing audience. And then the word all right. All right, Mom, you gave me the instructions. I won't forget to go to the market for you. All right. And the word all right, it's two words. A-L-L, -L, new word. R-I-G-H-T. But most people do it one word, A-L-R-I-G-H-T. I kid you not. A common error of Americans for sure. And then the word irregardless. There ain't no such word as irregardless. Irregardless, I know I'll do well in that test. Well, you won't do well if you use the word irregardless. Uh-uh. Don't do it. The word accommodation. At a previous lecture, I mentioned to you the word accommodation. My wife and I have written to a hotel which keeps sending us what our accommodations will be. And they spell accommodation A-C-C-O-M-O-D-A-T-I-O-N. But they do not know, that hotel does not know, that accommodation is spelled with two C's and two M's, as is, of course, the word accommodate. A common error in the United States of America. Oh, wait a minute, look at this one. Congratulations. Congratulations to the Flyers for getting that new goalie. And many people spell congratulations with a D in the middle. But congratulations, community college viewing audience, has a T in the middle, as in Thomas. A common error, for sure. The word cannot. I cannot do this lecture unless you promise me to continue till the very end, even though you're starting to fall asleep now. Cannot is one word. C-A-N-N-O-T. Most people don't do it that way. Uh-uh. It's one word, believe it or not. And then the word acknowledgement. Again, I'm going to give an acknowledgement to Community College of Philadelphia as being a great place. Acknowledgement has an E at the end when it's M-E-N-T, but elsewhere in the word there is no E. It's acknowledgement without an E. Just like argument is A-R-G-U-M-E-N-T. Judgment, J-U-D-G. Judgment without an E. Common errors, my goodness. And then one that really gets me. It gets me, and most people aren't even aware of it. Hey, Tom, I want to compliment you on your tie. Boy, that's a great tie you're wearing today, Tom. I guess your wife got that one for you, right? And the word compliment is spelled C-O-M-P-L-I-M-E-N-T. But there's another word compliment, and we'll talk about that shortly. And that word is C-O-M-P-L-E. M-E-N-T. For example, the tie that Tom is wearing is a complement to his shirt, meaning a match to his shirt. It goes well with his shirt. C-O-M-P-L-E. M-E-N-T. To compliment someone saying, you look great. The other compliment meaning it matches or it goes with or it brings out, so to speak. And then, folks, we have in this English language, grammar come alive. Here we go, Jay Perini. Here we go, Victor Borga. We have these things called synonyms, homonyms, and homographs. Now, don't ask me how they got their name. I'm not going into that. Uh-uh, won't do it. Of course, you can Google it, find out how those words came to be. One can look in a dictionary. But you know what synonyms are. Sure you do. Synonyms are words like rich and wealthy, words that mean the same thing. Words like jealous and envious, words like happy and joyful, different words, but they mean the same thing. And then we have this thing called homonyms. I told you I'd get back to compliment. Yes, I did, and you were going to test me on it too. 
compliments, C-O-M-P-L-I-M-E-N-T. My, you look great today. And compliments, C-O-M-P-L-E-M-E-N-T. That tie is a compliment to your eyes, is a compliment to your jacket, brings it out, matches, so to speak. Let's take the word as a homonym, meet. M-E-T-E, M-E-A-T, and M-E-E-T. Meet, M-E-T-E. I'm going to mete out that punishment to you. You were told to be in the house no later than 10 o'clock. You came in 11 o'clock. We worry as your parents. You're going to get some punishment. I'm going to mete it out to you, M-E-T-E. Of course, we all know meat, M-E-A-T. We eat meat. Sure we do. But then we have M-E-E-T. Meet me at Phillies game tonight. Meet me at the Phillies game tonight. Then we have as homonyms ail, A-I-L. Something hurts you. It ails you. Then we have the ail, you know. This type of ale, we have to watch it. We have too many of those. Then we have ad, an advertisement, A-D. We have ad, then we add a column of figures, A-D-D. -D. So homonyms are words like to, T-O, T-O-O, and T-W-O. T-O, of course, you know. I will talk to you later. T-O-O is, I hope you realize that I will meet you too, meaning meet you also. And the number two, T-W-O. Homonyms for sure. And now this thing called homographs. Again, don't ask me how they got their names. Look it up, will you please? I can't be bothered with all that stuff. But let's take meet again. M-E-E-T. I'm going to meet you later on at the track meet, M-E-E-T. Or let us say, I'm going to bow down to you. Bow, B-O-W, and bow. Spelled the same way, bow and bow. And then we have console. I want to console you on your loss, Bob. I'm sorry to hear about that, Mary. C-O-N-S-O-L-E. Or, let's listen to Mary Blige, Brianna, Beyonce, to determine which one is the best in our hearing on the console. C-O-N-S-O-L-E. I dove into the water, D-O-V-E. And as I dove into the water, I looked up and I saw a dove, D-O-V-E. So here you have homographs. They're spelled the same. They have different meanings. And for the most part, they sound the same, although not always. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We have people putting abbreviations all over the place. You're doing a paper for your wonderful English professor at Community College of Philadelphia. And you put on the paper, I live in Philadelphia, comma, USA. Can't do it that way. You have to put, I live in Philadelphia, which of course is in Pennsylvania, but I live in Philadelphia, United States of America. And then in the future in the paper, if you want to put United States of America, you can put USA after that, but first you must identify it as United States of America. People don't know that. Uh-uh. Grammar come alive. I hope indeed it is, and I hope you're still with me, grandfathers and grandmothers particularly, so that those grandkids say, gosh almighty, helping me with my homework. They sure are smart. You know what some people do, which is sort of an insult? Yes, they do. Let us say, and we use the name Ryan Howard again of the Philadelphia Phillies, and you say, I saw Ryan Howard hit a grand slam home run. And you write that down in an essay 
for school. And you put Ryan on one line and Howard on the next line. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. Can't do it. Oh, you can. But it's W-R-O-N-G. Names should be on one line. Write the sentence, I saw Ryan Howard hit a grand slam, so that Ryan Howard goes on one line. Did you ever wonder what N-E-W-S stands for? Oh, you know it. News, but it stands for North, East, West, and South. Yes, it does. North, East, West, and South. And while we're talking about directions, let me go further with directions. If you're writing an essay for your community college teacher or another school teacher from another school, you can say this. I want you to go north, go one mile, at the light, turn left, and go east. Then you're going to go about two miles at the stop sign, go south. Then at that stop sign, you'll go west to your destination. When you are giving directions, you do not capitalize north, east, west, and south. Again, I'll go, uh-uh, you don't do it. But isn't this confusing? If you're talking about a section of the country or a section of the city, I am going to go north for my holiday. I know people who are leaving in July to go north to the state of Maine. That's a capital N. So when you're referring to a geographic location, it's always a capital. Even if you're referring to a location in our wonderful city of Philadelphia, I want you to go to the south part of Philadelphia, a location. South would be with a capital S. You know, Victor Borga had a lot of fun with that semicolon. <coughs> semicolon. And a semicolon is used when one uses two complete sentences without a conjunction. May I explain? Stay with me. Thank you. Let's use the 76ers this time. I went to a 76ers game, <coughs> semicolon, I saw the Sixers win. There are two complete sentences. I went to a 76ers game, makes sense by itself, stands by itself. I saw the Sixers win, makes sense by itself. When you have two complete sentences, but you want to join them, you use a semicolon. Thank you, Mr. Victor Borga. <coughs> but let us say you take that sentence, and it might not be the exact sentence, but you'll get the idea. I went to a 76ers game, and I saw the Sixers win the game. Here, and is a conjunction, a joining word. So since you have a joining word there, you don't use a semicolon. Before the joining word, you use a, a comma. I went to the 76ers game. Makes sense by itself. Comma. And I saw the team win the game. Makes sense by itself. When you have a joining word, a comma goes in between. People talk about a dash and a hyphen. Now, a dash and a hyphen, this is very confusing. This is very confusing. A dash looks like this. A hyphen looks like this. They both look alike. They're the same thing. A dash and a hyphen. And I'm not going to go through the grammatical reasons that we use a dash and a hyphen. You can check that with your wonderful teacher at community college or wherever you might be going to school. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Listen to this grammatical error. Listen to this one. Hey, Mary, how many on that bus are going to the game? And the person calls back, none are going to the game. None are going to the game on this bus. They're going downtown to a museum. It's not none are. It's none is, because none means zero, and is is singular. My goodness, you knew that, didn't you? But most people say none are here today. 
none is here today would be proper. Take the word boys. Take it. I'm not giving you a choice. Just take the word boys. If you were to say, I went to the boys game, and there were a lot of boys on the team, that shows possession. Boys what? Boys game. So here it's with a lot of boys, B-O-Y-S apostrophe at the end. But if you're talking about going to the boy who's your grandson, one boy, I went to the boy's game. Yes, I did. I went to my grandson's game. I went to the boy's game. It's B-O-Y apostrophe S. So more than one, the apostrophe goes after the S. When it's one, it goes before the S. My goodness, this is so confusing. The seasons of the year. There are four of them. As I speak today, I don't know what time of the year you'll be watching this program, but it's a warm, humid day in Philadelphia. But that's expected in the summertime, is it not? And today is a day in July in Philadelphia, the year 2013. The seasons of the year are not capitalized when one is writing. It is in the fall, and I love the fall weather. It is in the summer, and summer brings a lot of fun. It is in the winter, it's in the spring. One does not capitalize the seasons of the year. Uh-uh. Isn't that crazy? Of course, if you use that in the title, you would capitalize it, would you not? I'm making up a title now. Spring is wonderful. That's the title. Spring would be capitalized. By the way, is is capitalized too because that's a verb. People would say, my, it's a little word. I don't capitalize that. I'm not going into the grammar about that now. Look it up now. Google it. Ask your teacher at the wonderful Community College of Philadelphia or elsewhere where you go. Everyone lost their way. They were on that trail. They were camping. And everyone lost their way. It's not everyone lost their way. It's everyone lost his way. Everyone lost her way. Everyone is singular. And it takes his or her after it. My goodness. How do you know something like that? Well, now you do know it. I just told you. Folks, grammar come alive. It's something I hope today it did come alive for you a little more. Jay Perini type of coming alive. The Victor Borga like coming alive. Grandmom, Grandpop, help those grandkids with their work so they will say, gosh, my Grandmom, my Grandpop, they sure are smart. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank you for joining us on CCP-TV, the educational channel of Community College of Philadelphia. I'm Burton Klein. I sure do hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.